And today, we indeed have a very distinguished panel of speakers who have very long uh, CV that I'm not going to take much time to read it out. So I will urge you to go through the folder, at least have a chance to, though many of them, you will know them already, but please uh, have a chance to read through a little bit more and before going through this. Just a little bit more about myself. In the last 30 years, I have been a digital entrepreneur. And the last six years, doing a lot more on a national service. Well, there are more trickling in. Welcome back. And one of the, uh, I think one of the most uh, important involvement since uh, about one and a half years ago, it is the uh, Malaysia uh, on the National Digital Economy and 4IR Council, uh, of which I'm, I'm council member and uh, looking into the, the whole plan. And eventually we launched My Digital. That was much spoken about in the previous session as well. I just want to highlight a few things here. This is the first time, also due to pandemic, there's a recognition that there's no way out. There is a need to have the whole nation approach. Indeed, it's a wholehearted approach towards national digital transformation. Easier said than done. Now, whole nation here, it means it cuts across everybody, from the public sector or the government. In fact, cover all the government agencies as well. Private sectors, GLCs to all the private companies, the community, any mom and pop, and those who stay at home, NGOs, and so, so forth. Whole nation approach. And there are six strategic trusts. The first strategic trust, we may laugh, but it's always necessary to put this first, which is actually digital infrastructure. You have heard of 5G. It seems like a very huge thunder, huge, huge noise. You have not seen the rain yet. It's coming. Fiberization of the whole country. Coverage of the whole population of the country. They're all on the way. So because of that, strategic trust in my digital, a lot more funding are actually being channeled into digital infrastructure. And we certainly have uh, that view that it is never enough. What we have today is definitely not enough. And what we have today is definitely better than yesteryear and the year before. So we must also look forward. And when we look at this glass in front of us, we can always say that it is only 60% full or 40% empty. We can always cry about 40% that is not having like superb connectivity or we can make the best use of the 60% that we already have today. So that's about digital infrastructure. It's an ongoing process, but the next three years will be critical in terms of fiberization and 5G. The next is actually digital government. It is the first time that it is uh, with a strong resolve, I use the word now, but strong resolve has to come, come from all the political uh, allocation of our funding as well. Uh, we shall see 80% of the government, federal government data migrating to cloud, cloud services. Why is it necessary? Only through cloud-based uh, data storage then we could actually streamline the processes. We could then share a lot more data and share the, the services and therefore become the true one windows to businesses and the citizen. And in five years, 100% of the government data shall be on the cloud. We'll see how this is implemented. And so far, a few of those big uh, 
award has been given already. Third one is actually the digital talent. And we talk about it in the morning uh, quite extensively. I think suffice to say that there's a recognition for our country to be digitally enabled, digitally transformed. We need 500,000 digital professionals. Whatever we do is not enough. There's a need to actually switch actively towards competency-based uh, digital skills. That also has to be industry-led, no longer uh, knowledge-driven, but then skills and competency-driven. All right. So in this case, from primary school, secondary school, tertiary, and post-tertiary, there are a lot of activities, a lot of effort there. And next year, I believe in our new budget that is coming up in the next uh, weeks or so, we will see huge allocation to the human resource development, particularly in the area of the digital talent. Next is actually the digital economy, of which every sector uh, should participate. And digital economy is also defined as businesses or organization that has a strong digital enablement in their business model. All right. So we expect that by this year, 20% of the GDP will come from that uh, what they call digital economy. So there are a lot more room, and certainly it is going to be one of the main topic of discussion today. Uh, next will be the, the digital community. You find that there's been a very major push towards the use of the cashless uh, apps like wallets, and then there's also a, a plan, a rollout of the digital identity. So that should make dealing with the government and commerce uh, a lot easier, and that will take the next two to three years. So when all these are in the making, it will always feel very slow. And lastly, it is about emerging technology that we have to choose in order to uh, select the suitable one in the context of Malaysia. Like IR 4.0 is a big umbrella. Digital, of course, it can cut across uh, all the industries. However, there will be some that are more relevant, more urgent than others. So therefore, we will need to make selection. All right, so that's a bit of context about digitalization of the whole country. And to take us into Penang, Penang uh, for future. Future forward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are going to have our speakers to share with us uh, perhaps about eight minutes or so, and then after that, we can have uh, some discussion, question and answer. All right. To start with, on my right, I will just say that uh, we have this very experienced uh, personality in our industry, uh, Datuk Sase Daran Vasu Devan. He said, call him Datuk Sase. And uh, he's the CEO of Penang Port, and uh, Datuk Sase, eight minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wei. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I don't have a presentation, so it makes me comfortable to stand after lunch. So uh, uh, now I'd like to touch on what uh, Dr. Tansi Hendru said this morning. Uh, tech is a game changer, uh, which is actually very relevant uh, when I talk about the port industry, a uh, little background, I'm uh, actually from Penang Ports in Denver. Uh, I've been uh, in the port business for, for 27 years, and um, the port business has always been resistance towards technology, uh, or, uh, sorry, digitalization to be more specific. Now, why? Because the, the industry itself has got huge capital outlay, and, uh, and there's always been a push to to digitalize ports and uh, because the cost outlay was so high and there was no motivation. And about 15 years ago, even a hardware to digitalize would, would cost a lot of money. We always ran the ROI and it was never workable. But until most recently, the, the hardware costs, you know, you know, the likes of Huawei and all that have just made it affordable. And uh, now, you know, 
now you have seen ports uh, digitalized more so ever in the last 10 years. Now, um, why, why towards the digitalization? You know, uh, we, we have an aggressive uh, plan to expand. We are trying to expand the capacity of the port by three times. We do about two million containers now and in, in terms of capacity, and we are trying to push that to six million. Uh, one of the other fears that we have uh, is, uh, is labor as well. And it's, it's, it's so difficult to get labor now. Nobody wants to come and work in the port industry anymore. Why? Because uh, Malaysia introduced minimum wage. Uh, until then, a port sector was quite interesting. But today, uh, probably McDonald's is more interesting because you work in an aircon and, and a more uh, friendly environment. Whereas port, you are exposed to nature. Uh, it's under the sun, rain, and there are also uh, safety elements working in a port. So why digitalize the port? So this is one of the major drivers that most ports in Asia are actually uh, digitalizing. And, and before, uh, well, labor costs in Asia was cheap. So it was okay to do that, but not so anymore. So um, basically a lot of drive in the port is to to digitalize is to innovate, uh, to enable efficiency. And I think uh, Michelle has pointed out this morning uh, from MICCI, uh, the, the increasing cost of logistic, you know, there's a big global uh, logistic meltdown that is going on. Uh, not because there is not sufficient capacity. Uh, for instance, uh, if, you, if you land a container in US West Coast today, uh, a container that used to take 12 days to return back to the port is taking 28 days. Why? Because there's no truck drivers, no warehouse operators. So, you know, you, you probably need a driverless truck now, you know, could have relieved the situation. Even ships that used to operate with 200 people are now today operating with just 15 people, uh, 400 meter ships. So, yeah, so in, in reference to that, I'm, I must say some of the ports that have actually gone full digital around the world, if I can make some reference here, uh, we have in Netherlands the, the Rotterdam port, uh, Germany, Hamburg, and France, we have Le Havre, Belgium, Antwerp, uh, in Spain, Algeciras is, uh, is also going towards uh, automation and digitalization. In Asia, we have our Singapore port, which is actually starting their new phase with full digitalization and, uh, and automation. China, we have Yangshan, Tianjin, Ningbo, and Qingdao. And in Japan, Tokyo, and also Dubai, which is handling about 14 million to use uh, in, in an automated and a digitalized uh, port. And uh, I would like to point out uh, the perspective which has changed uh, in the recent years, in the, in the last 10 years or so, uh, you know, about an investment of 10 billion has been spent on port automation and digitalization around the world. And uh, estimated that in the next five, 10 years, there's another 10 or 15 billion going on new port projects, which is uh, going to be digitalized. Now, for example, I have like to quote two ports here, which is close to Asia. Port of Qingdao, they, you know, they have invested uh, $460 million on, on port automation, a fully automated terminal. It was completed and delivered in May. 2017, and as an outcome, they've increased efficiency by 30%, reduced labor costs by 70%. So, and that port is uh, doing a design capacity of 5.2 million TUs of containers. Similarly, uh, down south at Australia, uh, we have the Melbourne Container Terminal, which also invested in something like 450 million US dollars, fully automated, there are 11 cranes and 20 automated stacking carriers. Uh, doing an annual capacity of, uh, of uh, 1 million TUs. And uh, recently there's an extract here, I'm reading from, from an extract from an Ericsson and Arthur Kilita report uh, on connected ports uh, published on February 20, 2021, uh, automating uh, equipment in ports like remote control ship to shore crane, uh, automated rubber tired gantries and vehicles now, the, the baseline throughput of that, of a, or a typical port of 4 million TUs and, a, and generating about 400 million of uh, revenue, the, the investment cost into digitalizing, digitalizing the port was about 146 million. The ROI is quite staggering. It's 178% ROI over five years. Uh, primarily coming from um, 
all the efficiencies and savings on labor. Yeah. So similarly, another report, uh, Moffat and Nickel have published about a 50%, 54% reduction of labor costs coming purely from automation and digitalization. So, so what are we doing in Penang in, in, in this line? You know, uh, I've just established the case that we, are, we have an aggressive uh, expansion and uh, labor has, has been highlighted as one of the uh, issues that we're gonna face uh, for coming years. But there's also a need to turn around ships in an efficient manner and, uh, and, and to, do, uh, to lower our cost of doing business in the long run. And uh, port has always never been a safer, safe environment to work. You know, there's always been accidents and uh, safety is always a concern. And we are trying to minimize human interaction in this open uh, area to create a safe working environment. So uh, we have actually charted uh, together with four other ports in Malaysia a digital roadmap. And, uh, and some of the initiatives that, that we have introduced is uh, uh, in the short term, we are actually looking at a technology like VBS, Vehicle Booking System, which was most recently launched in Penang Port. Basically, it's a very simple technology. It's like you have to turn up at the port gate with an appointment. You get an appointment and turn, turning up. Now, what does it do? It actually reduces congestion. We, we used to have port gates with long queues. Uh, people who are familiar with Bagandua, you will know that the intersection at Bagandua, where the police station is, used to be blocked off. And it, it used to create a lot of uh, concerns with the citizens living around the port, because we are also an urban port. So we have introduced a VBS system. We have uh, launched it uh, last month or so. Uh, and we hope that we should be able to by the time the container port handles two million TUs, we should be able to overcome all the congestion that arises in, in, in the port area at Butterworth. We, we are also taking over the Penang Ferry, and we have also going to introduce a, a ferry ticketing system, which is going to use uh, uh, wireless payments and digital payments. So that's one of the things on the cards. These are the, some of the... And, uh, and I'd like to show, share here uh, a little document I have here, uh, where we wanted to digitalize a, a very simple process in the port, and some of the challenges that came with it. Uh, we wanted to digitalize our surveillance. You know, we have a port. You know, we are a we are, we are a, a highly secure area, and uh, and we have a port police, uh, which which we do surveillance with trucks, and we wanted to digitalize that process. So we bought, we invested in drones. So um, a, a little experience of what we went through. The, the drone project was just launched last month. Uh, it took us two and a half years to get there. Uh, I just wanted to share that it went through eight regulators. Uh, I'm looking here, it's eight regulators uh, to get approval. Uh, and we are actually, the drones in the country are enforced by four different regulators, the enforcement itself. So uh, the nature of our drone, we, 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 we use 70% for surveillance and 20% for structural inspection. And, uh, and uh, just, to give, just to share some numbers, uh, the, 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 the CAPEX was about a million and a, and a five year ROI we are looking at is about nine million, just, just on, on the time, time and cost uh, payback on this project. So yeah, so, so in line with that, we have other stuff which is coming our way, uh, which is tracking solutions, predictive maintenance, a port community system, uh, video imaging, uh, analytics, uh, drones, and also wireless, uh, sorry, uh, automated cranes with remote control. So, uh, and th there's also a push in the port industry because all our surrounding stakeholders, they are digitalizing. I mean, you will later hear Annie talk about how much the warehouses have gone forward in terms of uh, automation and digitalization. So there's always a pressure on the ports, especially on the port industry, to actually digitalize. So uh, uh, yeah, I guess my eight minutes are up. I, I, I hope I shed sufficient perspective here from the port industry. Thank you. Thank you, Datuk Sasi. That was an excellent start. You see, when we think of port industry, that is supposed to be like highly mechanical. And in fact, last night I learned from Datuk Waseha 
that his uh, family business 100 years ago was also in uh, some sort of port services. But those days, without the container, that was a business. When the ship came, they provide the tongkang services to unload and then send it to the port. Right? And subsequently, of course, all the container ship, now they have cranes and so on. That was automation. Now, with the digitalization, with the drones, with all this, the rest of other facilities, what you've said is this, it has given 30% more productivity and 70% less labor costs. Congratulations, that was a good start. Anything can be digitalized. That's what you're saying. Just, just to add on, uh, you know, we, we, when we say reduction in labor costs, we're actually upskilling the labor in, in terms of uh, job. You know, it, it's not pure labor reduction. So basically, the avenue to upskill job as well. Great. Yeah. To continue the momentum, next I'd like to invite uh, Tony, uh, Tony Yo, who is the CEO of Digital Penang, to share with us the next eight minutes. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so this morning you heard a lot about um, how we should go digital and how we should change mindset. And so I'd like to talk about it in two parts. One, as a technologist, and then the second part, I want to talk about it as a policymaker. So the first part I want to talk about, uh, if you can put the slides up, is uh, as a technologist, how do we look at the change and why is it so urgent for us to go, go digital? So if you look at uh, the pandemic, what it has done, it has probably done more uh, drive get companies to go digital uh, than any CIO has ever done in their career. I mean, me being one in the past, right? So, but the thing is this, that a lot of them woke up one night and then found that they were actually like deer staring at headlights because they know they were unprepared because suddenly they all have to go online, but their infrastructure is just not there. People don't even have laptops. All the government departments work from home, but they don't even have mobile laptops. So they're just totally unprepared. Now I'm going to talk about three major shifts that's happening, that why is it so urgent for us to go digital? The first one is this. A lot of them have already actually talked about this. The old equation in the economy is that you have land, labor, and capital. And that's the factors of your production in, that's the measure of your GDP. But that's actually changing today. If you look at what's the future, it's actually land capital plus talent, machines and markets. Now I give you an example of why it has changed. What is Singapore's strategy? Singapore's strategy is a capital strategy. They have one trillion dollars in reserve. All they need to do is let you go and invest in all your venture and then they'll just buy them and then bring them over and create the jobs in Singapore. That's what they did with Grab. And that's what they're going to continue to do. They attract all the billionaires to park the money there. So their game is a capital game. What is the game for Vietnam and Indonesia? They're a market game. I have the market. I have 200 million people. I can produce and I can consume. We are prosumers. I have the data. You want to test your AI? Come to my market. So they are ahead of us. Vietnam is also in that game, 100 million people. So what's the other game? The talent game that you have to be in. Either you have to, have to be the entrepreneurs or you have to have deep skills. So one good example is the fact that Penang has the E&E &E ecosystem. So at least we have the deep skills inside there. So that is a key thing for us. But what's really happening is that machines is actually displacing labor. So in the previous session, when we talked how the workforce has changed, the workforce has been hollowed out in the middle. You only have two extremes, one very manual or one very deep skill. All those jobs that are in the middle will disappear or will be displaced by machines. If you don't think that's real, look at this. Western Digital has just announced 
is the first light salt factory in the region. One out of only six in the world. And that's going to happen even more and more. The jobs are going to disappear because you only have people supervising machines. But in the future, it will be machines making machines, machines supervising machines. That is what is IR for. I'll talk about, as a policymaker later on, where we are on this and how far we are from IR4 in Malaysia. So, don't think IR4 is still imaginary. It is real. The next shift is actually what's happening in China. If you've heard of the One Belt and One Road, the BRI, that's actually only the physical thing, the Maritime Silk Road and the Land Silk Road. But very few of us have heard of the Digital Silk Road, which was actually launched in 2015. And they have actually launched their first GPS navigation system already. They do not depend on the American navigation system anymore within China and even outside China as well. They have 42 geosatellites already and they're connecting a lot of the Asia Pacific already. So this is a, going to be a very game changer in the region for us. And if we don't plug into this, we're going to miss the boat. Again, we're going to become deer staring at headlights. So, are we going to be a boiling frog? Are we going to just sit there and not do anything? Because this is very urgent for us to go digital. The third shift is this. The third shift, if you have not heard about it, is all this convergence of technology between nanotechnology in material science, in biotechnology, in cognitive technology, and in infotechnology, ICT, all converging, trying to solve the ecological problems that we have in climate change and climate control, and the race to space is what's happening. If you look at Elon Musk, Phantom 4, all the launches into space by Bezos, this is the space race that's happening. When you talk about a type 2 civilization, today we're a type 1 civilization. Nikolai Kardashev scale. A type 1 civilization means we have taken over the whole planet of Earth. We have managed to capture the energy and to grow based on what is on Earth. A type 2 civilization is an interplanetary civilization because we are afraid that the asteroid will hit Earth and therefore, Elon Musk thinks that we need to make sure that humans survive and therefore we, he wants to colonize Mars. So that's a type 2 civilization that the Americans are aiming for and looking at an interplanetary civilization. A type 3 civilization obviously is an intergalactic civilization where Milky Way is going to be able to travel to Andromeda. right? And so this is what we're talking about. The game that we're talking about in Penang, it's actually very small. We're looking at it at a very, very small island proportion. When you look at the game that's happening globally, it's about the space race. Everybody is trying to launch and go into space. SpaceX has already launched 4,000 LEO satellites, a constellation mesh over North America. The space grab is happening today but nothing is happening already yet in Asia, okay? And so that will solve the interconnectivity issue that we have. Okay, so if I have not convinced you about the three major shifts that's going to happen in technology, speaking as a technologist, this is what's going to happen and it is already happening. Today, Moore's law is already gone. Moore's law states that computing power will double every two years. It's taking longer now but the five nanometer chip is already out. When the chip computing power is so important and so high, and the AI algorithms is very strong, plus the fact that the battery technology is highly improved, machines is going to really now going to be evolved and going to take over a lot of things. And that's where the future is going. Now, so, now let me talk about it from a policymaker perspective. So, who we are, and uh, we were established in the midst of the pandemic. Again, like I said, it was like a deer staring into headlights, panic. We need to have this agency to look at 
the digital initiatives to try and realize the Penang 2030 vision of a family-focused green smart state. So to go smart, you have to go digital, right? And that was the vision. And so we came out with a DTMP, which uh, you can have a copy of it as you go out. And basically, we are only trying to set the foundation because we are so far away from where we should be. So one of the key aims, obviously, as what Dr. Ways was talking about, is about the digital infrastructure. And obviously, on this is we have to work with MCMC at the federal level to roll out the 5G network, hopefully by next year, and also uh, by 2023 for the whole state. The other thing is about digital community. Now, to go digital, it's actually about changing culture. What did China do? 95% of the population are now using e-wallets. When everybody goes digital payments, you create markets. You create digital markets, and then you create entrepreneurship. You allow entrepreneurs to create digital solutions. Right? So that's the one key thing is, therefore, we need to educate people to adopt digital technology. If they do not adopt digital technology, there's no digital market, entrepreneurism cannot happen. So that's one of the key aims that we're doing, and we're trying to work with all the, the aduns in the various constituencies to basically get people to adopt technology. The third piece is in digital economy. Under the digital economy piece, we are focused on three things. One is we need to get the local companies to go digital and go international. The borders is the world. You have to go out and compete in the world. It's no longer your own little mafia or your own silos in the state itself. You have to break and compete internationally. And that's basically uh, what Tan Sri Andrew was talking about. You have to break down the silos, work together and compete internationally and using digital. The third one is obviously a digital startup ecosystem. And that's very important uh, because without entrepreneurship, then the digital technology is not going to happen. We've been very successful with the engineers in, the, in the, all the unicorns that has happened, but not so much with the technologists. The last piece is actually the adjacent sector. Where are we? Because we cannot continue to just, well, we, what Dato Sri Wong Zihai said is correct. We've got a golden goose, which is in the E&E &E industry. But while that goose is still laying eggs, we better start to start to lay other eggs, right? If we don't build other goose, then we are going to have a lot of trouble. And so what is the next adjacent sector for us? Is it the space technology that we should start to get into? Because we are probably still ahead of Vietnam and Indonesia if we are trying to get into that space, right? Is it AI that we should be getting into? And that's where we should be focusing on. The last piece is obviously digital governance, which is probably the hardest piece for us to move. And that is obviously working with Mampu, trying to align them, uh, trying to get the data out. It's just so impossible to get data, how to share the data. And then of course, obviously, what are some of the things uh, in smart city that we can create projects out of that. The two major challenges that I see uh, when we do this in policy making, one of the challenges is this, right? In Penang alone, we have 66,000 SMEs. And across Malaysia, we have 1.1 million SMEs. They provide 90% of the jobs. But in Penang alone, out of the 66,000, there are 3,000 in manufacturing. Now, as a policy and as a program, we cannot do this, right? We cannot say every, every, every company that wants to go digital will give you 100,000 grant. Just for the 3,000 manufacturing companies, that's 300 million ringgit. We cannot just give out grants, right? We cannot give out grants to the private sector to do that, to say, please go digital. The private sector needs to understand that it is about market competition. How do you become competitive with digital technology? And only then the government can try and do things to support that. And the two key things most of them are asking for is access to experts and access to markets, basically. Because on, if you're a good entrepreneur, you understand the market. So from a policy-making perspective, the government tries not to interfere in the market if it is efficient. For example, the E&E &E industry is fairly efficient. 
they know what to do, they know how to compete, so we tend to leave it alone, right? So it's only in the other sectors like logistics, tourism, in medical care, uh, in other uh, sectors that we see, okay, because we, our investment is so narrow, we need to now say how do we attract investments into those sectors. So that's one of the challenges in terms of that. The other challenge is that we have a lot of aging owners and aging equipment. Some of them are in IR1. They're not even in IR3, you know? So don't talk about IR4. How do you get them from IR1 to IR4? And the aging owners say, I'm very happy, I'm going to retire already. I have no succession plans. All my successors are overseas. So how can the government intervene and interfere in that? You cannot. The market has to decide that. So from an economist's point of view, the market must decide whether they want to be competitive. The government can only stimulate and incubate some of the things. The last point that I wanted to make is this. To go digital, you need a lot of ICT talent. Just in Penang alone, if you look at our ICT industry and our ICT talent, I mean, this is one of the reasons why, even though I'm Penang born and bred, I couldn't get a job as an IT guy. I have to go overseas. And that's because most of it is in the Klang Valley. Yeah? Why? Because all the federal agencies are in the Klang Valley. Every time they run a program, the Klang Valley benefits first. Right? Nothing happens outside Klang Valley. Now, only beginning to see signs happening in Johor, Sarawak, Penang, maybe, and Sabah. And that's important for us that we need to have a strong ICT sector if we want to go digital. On that, I thank you. Wow. Thank you, uh, Tony. So, the view of uh, from technologies to policy maker, in this case, is a planner, and also to spell out challenges. I thought you were going to give us the answer, but we will explore how to tackle those challenges uh, during the, the next session, right? I mean, the question and answer session. And to continue the momentum, may I invite Dr. Henry Go to, yeah, to share with us your thoughts on this uh, digitalization. Hello, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, it's always nice to be back in Penang. You know, I've been uh, based out of Penang for the past 30 years. Uh, I've established a company, a digital technology company in Kuala Lumpur. We are a Malaysian-based company, but it's always very nice to be back in Penang. Uh, and this is where my hometown is. And whenever I'm given the opportunity to share some thoughts and to do some work in Penang, uh, nothing will stop me from doing that. Uh, and of course, thanks to KSI now, and of course, uh, Tan Sri Michael for giving me the opportunity again to speak in Penang and to share some thoughts uh, to my fellow Penang Knights as well. Um, you know, I, I'm coming very much from the uh, private sector. You know, uh, my brothers and I started a digital company called Microcures about 20 years ago. We are based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, but we are also operating in 14 different countries around the region, uh, helping companies to go digitalization. Uh, we have also helped some com uh, government agencies uh, to go digitalization as well, uh, such as, for example, uh, we, are, we did the iCitra and iCina project for the KWSP or EPF in that sense. Uh, so that's what we do as a company. Um, but as we see for the past 20 years, you know, um, even the, a lot of uh, digital roadmaps, uh, even the, our country itself, uh, we have introduced many different kinds of, of roadmaps and blueprints and directions and expand, way of expanding our taxpayers' money. I think the key area that is still very much lacking in that essence comes from a form of um, innovation. Many a times uh, we have been talking about even projects like uh, Jandela or projects like fiberization, uh, projects like infrastructure, um, it always comes to a point where whilst it's a digital infrastructure, it comes in a form that is also very much uh, hard infrastructure, like laying cables or putting up satellites, for example. 
what it needs us in that point. I think it's a good thing, it's definitely needed, don't get me wrong, but I think what it needs then, what is the water that needs to flow through the pipes? I think this is one part that uh, uh, we have missed, um, and this is one part that we should really address. Um, quite a number of years ago, I was speaking to our um, ex-Prime Minister, Tun Mahathir. You know, um, Malaysia at one time spends a lot of money building hard infrastructure. We have probably one of the best highways around the region. Uh, we have the most extensive highway systems in the region as well. But the vision of our Prime Minister at the time is then say, we should not have Japanese cars only on the road or European cars only on the road. I think what it needs to be then would be our own Malaysian cars should be on the road. And I think that's where the whole innovation of building our own cars putting our technology. Uh, obviously, uh, we have some good successes and probably not so good successes, but generally, we have our own cars on the road. And I think that's what, um, um, not just Malaysia as a whole, but I think Penang itself uh, needs to be able to have blueprints and directions and focus uh, towards uh, driving innovation. Uh, not only just having our Penang Nikes, not having just Malaysians, uh, in the form of having the best smartphones, uh, digitalized, connecting to the internet, having the best 5G technology, but what technology are we using? Um, what kind of services are we using? And most of the time, having this access to internet, having access to technology, some form or another, we are opening our, our, our population, opening our markets to outside commercial companies to benefit. Uh, say, for example, there are companies that are based in Singapore offering services up here in Malaysia, and they can offer their services seamlessly, easily, because of the infrastructure that Malaysian taxpayers' money have gone to. So, in that retrospective, it's good level playing ground is being open because of technology. I think innovations and direct innovations needs to happen, and I think uh, is of course not just a government uh, initiative, but I think it's a government driving the, the, the private sectors together as a team to drive innovation uh, in terms of uh, making Malaysians at least utilizing Malaysian technologies and helping the ability for Malaysians to build technologies that will suit Malaysia in itself. I think that's the key part where um, Penang can move forward as a very strategic place because, uh, you know, Penang is a small place, I would say, you know, uh, but the people are very homely, I like that, and we do have our own culture. I think this is a part where then we can drive innovations that can suit our own industry, it can suit our own populations very, very uh, easily. And I think that's one part where then, you know, um, uh, you should start to then bring in companies in the sense of offering them easy test beds to be available in Penang. Uh, maybe uh, things like if I want to run this business, can I have a sandbox that runs very easily in Penang so that probably the Penang government can very easily give them the approval to do that. Uh, not like uh, even having drones need to go through eight different <laughs> uh, uh, ministries. I mean, of course, that also involves the federal government, but. Generally, the key idea is to then having the ability to say that I'm going to come to Penang, I'm going to test this technology, and this technology must be opened up to all Penangites, or even to Penang Industries, and how we can use that as a, as a form of driving innovation. Um, of course, talent is another key thing um, of driving innovation, and I think this is also something that uh, I think the panel has talked about a lot this morning, but generally, the, the key idea is that the soft part of it, the talent, uh, and also, not only just driving talent of helping companies to go digitalization, but talents that can produce products, can produce innovation, can produce technology, and that is the most important part of a blueprint that, that I think should be and have been part of the Penang and, for example, the government's overall uh, initiative as well. So, yeah, that was what I wanted to share really. Uh, the way. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Henry. You talk about the need for Malaysian, 
local or Penang, local innovation that is suitable for a local market and condition, right? All right, we are going to kind of quickly move on to, you know, the lady that come last, which is highly unusual. Uh, any call is going to share with us a further idea about digital transformation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's not ladies first anymore, right? It's ladies last, but that's fine. <laughs> I've got a presentation. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, on digitization. How can we actually help? Uh, basically, um, one of the, the items that we actually wanted to answer here is how can the more, more successful businesses and industries assist those lagging behind? So more from a practical perspective. So yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get used to this. Which one, which one is this? Oops, yeah, okay. So yeah, so um, I'm actually gonna cover uh, actually only three topics. It's technology trends and the new normal. Uh, we're going to talk about the Penang uptake and what are the barriers really to digitization in companies and how do we then bridge the divide? So sorry, because I can't actually see the thing, right? Uh, and how do we ensure delivery and value? And of course, then the next steps. So on technology trends and the new normal, digitization, the definition of it is actually to use technology to transform business models so that we can support new revenue and value producing opportunities. And this is actually the Gartner IT glossary, right? So if you look at all the new technological trends that is actually available now, you actually see automation, RPAs, IMP meaning OCRs. You actually also have um, what are called the IOTs, AIs, data analytics, e-commerce, APIs, the new and um, what you call the upcoming messaging standards, and um, that actually promotes e-commerce. You also have 3D printing, and you actually have virtual realities, I forgot about drones, and also wearables. Now, all of this digitization that you're talking about are the technological trends at the moment that is actually quite hot. And all of these are actually supported by cloud computing. Because without cloud computing, many of this cannot work properly. So what's actually important is basically when you talk about cloud computing, one of the major components of it is really connectivity. In other words, the infrastructure to the cloud. So having said that, um, with the pandemic and what's actually happened in the last 18 months, you will find that we are now in the new normal. We need to actually enable working anywhere, everywhere. We also need accessibility. In other words, how do you make accessibility to your applications and your solutions within your company uh, be able, so that your, your, what call that, your staff can actually assess and still be able to do their work? Then, of course, at the end of the day, as I said again, Connectivity is one of the most important thing that enables it. Without connectivity, we can talk about all the digitization that we want to do, it's just going to fail. Then of course, with the pandemic as well, we actually see a lot more cybersecurity incidences because it's easier, much easier to actually then hack into your um, businesses because they can go through the home networks and stuff like that, right? So cybersecurity also becomes a very important part as far as, um, uh, the new normal is, and the last and, and um, not least is actually automation because you start thinking, hey, look, you know, if my guys get uh, infected with COVID, they cannot come to work, what happens then? Then we need to think about what we can do for the future. It's a little bit too late now to think about it, but it is important that we think about the future. So it's about automation if we can. But as we also know, uh, within Penang itself, the industries, at least if we talk about the small, medium-sized industries, we actually have a wide range in terms of the spectrum. You have some that's still on IR1 and some already in IR4. So the point here is it's not one size fits all. 
And I also want to say this about technology. Technology, you implement it only if it makes sense. There is an ROI, you implement it. Don't implement it if it doesn't make sense because it doesn't help you anyway. So it's the practical part of technology. So I want to come back again a little bit more on the connectivity and infrastructure because I want to highlight this, right? When we talk about um, the DTMP for, for Penang uh, for the next three years, I actually think that infrastructure, if we do not do anything about it, will be the biggest failure because um, as I read the, the thing very briefly, uh, it talks about patchy access and even areas where you cannot even get access. On top of it, I will also want to say this from an um, uh, industry perspective, Infrastructure in Malaysia is very, very expensive. If you compare it with Asia-Pacific, Malaysia has the second most expensive infrastructure. Okay, um, The one that is actually more expensive than us is actually Indonesia. But I think they are doing something about it. So we need to do something about making the cost more, what do you call that, um, economical for the businesses to actually grow and bring the revenue back to Malaysia. So it's, I think, something that I wish, I hope the government is listening to and will do something about it. Okay, so next um, is about the Penang uptake and barriers to digitization. So um, basically, I've actually broken it up into two separate sectors in, in terms of the industry. One is the MNCs, the other one is the small and medium-sized companies. So when you look at digitization, a lot of it are actually happening in the multinational companies. Why? Because digitization in general in these companies are actually head office driven. Right? So because of that, it actually gets uh, auto, um, what got spread out into the Penang industries and we benefit from it. And it normally becomes part of the strategy. They actually have a focal department actually looking at this. So i just give you an example. In Schenker, we actually have our CIO is also a CDO, which is a Chief Digitization Officer. So this is now what's happening in the market. For those companies that really believe in digitization, they actually have a chief digitization officer that actually focuses on digitization, and that helps to make it a reality, to be honest, right? And on top of it, um, the mindset of all these global companies is that they look at it as an R&D investment and explanatory mindset. That means not everything that you try will, will be successful, but you're willing to put in the investment to try it out anyway. So that's actually an important part about digitization. And, it's the pos and they're also very, what you call, possibility and future focused, right? Um, and proactive, and that's why the digitization actually a little bit faster in those companies. And digitization is not really an IT topic alone. I just want to highlight this because, I mean, every one of us, when we talk about digitization, we think it's IT. IT plays a part of it, but I can honestly tell you, the business people, the operations play a very, an equal part of it. So let's put it this way. We talk about big data or we talk about data analytics. The IT people can bring out the data for you, but if the business people cannot make any good use or any uh, what called intelligence out of it, you are not going to get anywhere also. So you have to think about that as well. And there are now a lot of, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, applications and solutions which are actually quote-unquote end-user friendly. That means the users can help themselves to actually do some digitization on their own. So we have to look beyond IT because when you only look at IT, unfortunately, we are limiting ourselves, right? Now, for the small, medium-sized business, normally digitization is what I call a need to or a business critical area. So only if they need to, they implement. For some, if they are more forward-looking, yes, you do have actually a lot more for those that's actually gone industry for, for, that, for that matter. So R&D today, or rather the investment that they put in, are normally more for direct an immediate impact to the business. That means it can immediately see it, they put the money in there. So less on exploratory uh, technology. And um, they are very now focused, very reactionary. And the top three focus, this is based on a study that was made. Um, because of the pandemic, all the SMEs in Asia Pacific are actually looking at accelerating their digitization programs, right? And the three top focus for them at the moment is cloud adoption upgrading their security and IT infrastructure. Okay. Oops. 
Okay, so I just wanted to share that there was a study made by, um, uh, what do you call that, sorry, um, Asia Pacific SMB Digital Maturity Study, uh, which is also in line with the forecast by International Digi Data Corporation. And according to them, the digitization of small and medium businesses in Asia Pacific could add 2.6 to 3.1 trillion US dollars to the Asia Pacific GDP by 2024. And it contributes, it will contribute to the region's economic recovery post COVID-19. So you can imagine how big the impact for small, medium-sized company. And, and if I recall, I think uh, Tony mentioned there are 66,000 SMEs alone in Penang. So you can imagine if even one of every single one of them just improved by about one to 10%, you can imagine the amount of uh, businesses or rather, you know, the impact it is, right? So having said that, um, for the rest, sorry. I don't know why it's not working. No more battery. Okay, uh, yeah, so, okay, sorry. So for the rest of the talk, I will actually be focusing more on how we can assist the small and medium-sized company to digitize more, right? So I would like to first uh, share a little bit on what I think the barriers to digitization is. So one of them is really cost pressures, right? Because it costs money. Sometimes when you want to digitize, especially when it's an R&D base, it may cost a lot of money to buy the software just to try it out. Then, of course, there's always what we call the talent crunch. We, we always keep on, we have heard so many people talking about us not uh, producing, um, um, what do you call the universities not producing the people that we need. Okay, I've got my own views on that, right? I actually think, I actually agree with David, uh, Professor David, uh, when he mentioned that universities are supposed to, end, to teach our people uh, to be able to think, to be able to, uh, what do you call that, do problem solving and stuff. I think it's quite impossible for us to expect our universities to actually produce people that is, um, what do call that, business competent, because all businesses are different as well. So having said that, I think, you know, for some reason we have been, uh, we have been saying, oh, you know, our universities have not been producing the people that we want. So now they are trying to do that, but I don't think they'll be successful because they don't have the practical knowledge. I think that's something that we need to understand, right? So having said that, um, we don't know how to start. That is actually one of the biggest issues because the SMEs, while they want to go digitization, they just don't know how to start. And this is actually supported by another study that was done for Philippines in 20, uh, 2020. They actually mentioned that they didn't know where to start or how to start digitization. Sorry, yeah, okay. And then of course, success is about mindset. So to me, it's a company mindset, right? The company has to want to do digitization. The company, at least the CEO, the top management must believe that there is value to it. And then last and foremost, as I mentioned again, infrastructure. Okay, so um, last slide actually, how do we bridge the gap? How do we ensure delivery and value? So in my mind, currently we have many initiatives, at least I think Penang is very active, very, uh, what called, trying to be proactive in doing a lot of things. We actually have the Penang Science Cluster. We have the monthly Northern Corridor Innovation Forums. We now have the Digital Transformation Master Plan, 2021 to 2023. What I find um, is uh, it's not really executable or rather implementable because definitely I think the issues with it is coordination, the reach, the vague goals, and execution. So what can we, what can or must we do differently? So for me, it is about what's our baseline? Where are we now, right? What do we want to do and what's our target? So my suggestion is actually we should create an ecosystem or a steering committee to support the digitization initiative. And I think that the, the other thing is we should establish an empowered center of excellence to spearhead the digitization in Penang. So when I talk about ecosystem, I'm actually thinking that the ecosystem should have representatives from the government, from the solution application vendors, from clubs and associations like PICOM, uh, small, medium-sized companies, multinational companies, very quickly, uh, and training partners, including universities. And this will form the ecosystem. And I think you can read the roles, Sam. Huh? <laughs> so, um, 
the roles, then I will just, last one is actually the Centre Excellence. So the Centre Excellence, the, the rule for them is really to provide education and exposure. So they will work with the training partners to provide the training and even from uh, the experts from the MNCs that's already done this. And they should, act, they should also be doing knowledge sharing, right? Use case sharing, because from there, that's where innovation comes from. Because if you don't know anything, you cannot innovate. But the minute you hear, oh, somebody did this, oh, maybe I can do this, you know what I mean? And that's how innovation starts. So that's very important. The second one is about enabling with practical application. That means they can have R&D labs, that people can try things out. Um, they can work on internships with companies. Yeah, so then they actually get the, uh, the knowledge about how the business works and stuff and make the, what called the graduates, um, more, what you call that, business ready, right? And then um, projects. So the, the training as well is upskilling, right? Upskilling of the current people. You can also upskill, let's say, if you're displacing a group of people uh, from the production line, maybe you can upskill them to do RPA, example, right? And also cre doing projects that will benefit the industry as a whole. And also we can put in, uh, and they also should be maximizing potential by providing coaching and mentorship. And, and at the end of it would actually be encouraging and driving the uptake because at the end of the day, most of the time, there is a, a huge uh, energy at the beginning, but you lose the thing. So last and, and not least, it's actually running competitions, giving rewards, incentives, and maybe taking the grants and only giving it when it becomes successful. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, looks like, you see, we have saved the, the best to the last, right? All right. Uh, MC, do we have question for one, uh, time for one question? One question, one quick question. All right. We have, we have heard of the big trend. We have heard of the big vision, digital port. We have heard of the challenges and what has to be done. Uh, I'd like to argue that even though we know there are various factors contributing towards digital uh, transformation, such as funding, the people, technology, infrastructure, but there's one overarching factor that will decide whether or not we all move forward. It is the digital leadership. i just like to have everyone to just use one minute to give your view how collective digital leadership, that means all the leaders here, all the leaders outside, all the leaders of every organization could collectively drive digitalization. I like your view on this. Starting from the lady first. Okay, yeah, hi. So, uh, as you can see, I talked about the ecosystem. In the ecosystem, I'm actually asking all of these people to be within it because it's talking about digital leadership. It's about setting the, the strategy, right? Not, um, what you call, not controlling them, but setting the strategy to say, and also maybe to prioritize the areas of digitization that we can go in. Like for instance, if you're talking about IR1 companies, maybe we can talk about, okay, what, is that, what are they lacking? Is it an ERP system? Maybe we can talk about SAS because it becomes now cheaper to do it rather than having to spend so much money. So things like that, right? Yeah. So I agree. It's about digital leadership. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Henry. Okay. One, one minute, please. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so, yeah. yes, I think it's, it's important in terms of uh, digitalization should come all the way from the top. So not, you know, a lot of companies that uh, my company have been dealing with, they just send in an IT manager they sign in a manager to discuss with us. There's nothing wrong about that, but then the point is that they could be buying something that they're not able to fully implement or fully execute in the company. So it's always coming from the top leadership itself is really very, very important. So CEOs need to put an effort in doing that. I think, of course, secondly itself, I think um, it's also very important to try it out because a lot of companies are not willing to go digitalization simply because they want to look at a proven model have it worked before somewhere else is it working here for me or not and this can be very tough but you can always try to be a leadership in the sense of trying things out first irrespective of whether other competitors are having it or not and i think that will help you to digitalize your business much quicker and better Th thank you yes tony uh i think uh 
from a government perspective, I think the belief is that the markets is efficient. And so government intervention programs can only be if the market is inefficient. In the case of digitalization, I think the private sector needs to step up and take that leadership and then see what can the government help to solve. For example, regulations, incentives, or whatever, right? But the, gov the leadership must come from the industry. And that is very clear because, like I've said, if there are 3,000 SMEs, and we want to give 100,000 grant, that's 300 million ringgit, that's, we don't have that money. So the leadership must come from the private sector, believing that they have to be competitive to survive. And that is the only way forward. Great, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I believe it's an agenda that you cannot refuse anymore to stay relevant in business. So digital, digitalization is a must, and of course, uh, the, the, the business case is very important and you know what do you want to digitalize and how much do you want to digitalize and the, the roadmap is definitely to be driven by the leadership of the organization. Well, there's concurrence of digital leadership to be single one of the most important factors towards the whole digital transformation either in a state, across all the industry or uh, at a national level. Uh, lastly, I would also suggest that digital natives is to be included. You know, there are many people here who may find digital tools, applications to be of a, a bit awkward kind of uh, tools for them, simply because we are not digital native. However, those who are growing, who have been growing up with a mobile phone, with social media, with all kinds of software and apps, it is like putting fish in the water. Right? So we must embrace digital natives, young talent in the whole journey of digital transformation. So with that, I'd like to ask everyone to give a big hand to thank all the panelists here. Thank you.